really. Um, and I also love sharing uh, random facts about me with people. Can I get this here? Uh, so, yeah, according to... Oh, no, fun fact, yeah. Uh, according to my, like, the shortcut on my keyboard, those are three emojis that I overuse. Funny, and XD has a special place in my heart. So, yeah, that was very insightful. We can now circle back to our Johnny and see how we might help him um, to ease his stress and nerves. Okay, so let's start with the board. You remember there was an icon with the board that was full of tasks. Uh, the approach that helped me personally a lot was cleaning it right to left. So, first of all, release what you can, if you can. Um, if something is released but doesn't meet the definition of done, if you have a definition of done, we'll fix that too. For us, for example, is um, documentation. Oh, no one likes writing documentation, right? But yeah, if it's not done, we cannot close the tickets and it will just hang in the, on the board forever. We don't want that. Uh, you can help out with testing, believe me or not. QAs are also human beings, like human beings. They can be overloaded with work. Um, so maybe helping them out will speed the process up a little bit. Um, yeah, finish what you already started. <laughs> that one might sound obvious, but not always is. In the companies, it often happens that you might get blocked by uh, some other team or uh, yeah, you are just stuck for whatever reason. If you get blocked, maybe you can do something about with unblocking yourself, like helping out other team if that's possible for you. Getting out of your comfort zone is always a cool place because comfort zone is nice and comfy. It has a comfort in the name, literally. Um, but it's outside of it when we actually grow. And even though our Johnny might not think about growing right now because he's way too stressed to do that, um, it's still nice to clean it up and speed the process up and li limit your work in progress. That's very important because your cognitive load is very restricted. And context switching, well, it's costly, right? Because you, you constantly keep switching between different threats. And yeah, once you start doing that, there is very big likelihood that you will never get anything done. And cleaning the board actually will make your POs and managers happy, so yeah, win-win. Moving on to um, the code base and the code that you write, because you remember he got assigned this MVT, very important, VIT, very important task that was due yesterday. Um, so you can actually look into the KISS principle. Mm. It might sound like another stating the obvious, but you will get a lot of stating the obvious in this uh, presentation. Uh, this is actually something made up by Americans, <laughs> so it has to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, always look for the simplest possible solution, and it's not about kissing your boss's ass, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, the more complexity you add to anything, the more you will have to put work later on to maintain it or extend it. In code, it can start from as simple things as clean variable namings, no redundancy, no unnecessary comments. Um, I mentioned DDD at the very beginning. Maybe you not really need it. If you create just one small microservice, so, well, maybe you don't need microservices at all. Um, or if you are working with DevOps, maybe uh, there was a concept of um, multi-cloud. I mean, there still is the concept of multi-cloud. And there was a very interesting study conducted by, I have it noted, Strata, that in 2022, over 82% of one billion dollar if in revenue enterprises were running on multi-cloud. So if you are not working for one of those huge enterprises, maybe you don't need multi-cloud? Well, maybe you don't need a cloud at all? Yeah, I said it out loud. So let me now take a step back. If you are a designer, 
maybe you could limit the amount of fancy blinking buttons and pop-ups that are shiny like a Christmas tree on the New Year, new, in the New York City during Christmas time. If we overdo them, every customer will become a Grinch sooner or later. Please don't destroy Christmas to people. Um, but I'm sure that at this point you get what I mean, right? Like simplicity should be always held in mind. Oh, this one is my personal deal breaker. I always keep forgetting about it. But um, what? Um, yeah, the, going back to the uh, system that Johnny had to design. Should he jump right away? into the implementation, setting up cloud infrastructure, security, code, without any structuring about thinking of how does he want to do this. If you have kids, you probably know the Miss Rachel show on YouTube. If you don't, <laughs> lucky you. Um, but she has one nice song, which is Stop, Breathe Slowly. So Johnny, please, stop, breathe slowly, don't jump anywhere just yet. Take a deep breath and keep the big picture in mind. It adds value. Uh, but take also baby steps, like a small steps to implement it. Divide this huge thing into smaller tasks and write them down, make actual to-do list. Keep it transparent so that your POs and managers know what you're doing. Be careful for the micromanagement, but um, yeah, write them down, keep them transparent, and that will actually help you restrict the amount of the cognitive load in you, right? Because it will take off one of the threats that will certainly be going on in the back of your head. Mm, so yeah, maybe delivering working software frequently with a smaller changes will be better, like the minimal value product, than introducing the scale right away. And here, if we are talking about designing a new systems that our poor Johnny has to do, I cannot not mention or touch a little bit of architecture. So he will, um, we will touch a little bit of lean principle and the big three Cs, which is connection, cohesion, and changeability. Um, the whole idea, like in the short cut here, is to make a decision with just enough knowledge to grasp the, the, sword, the, the, the essence, the key of the issues you are facing. If you don't have enough knowledge at a given point of time, maybe postponing making this decision will be a better, better smarter choice for you. Um, here again, my favorite DDD. Um, it's nice because it gets you closer to business, you, you align with them in a way, but maybe you could use only some of it, like when you're starting from scratch, maybe even storming session is a good idea to grasp the issue and to understand the business problem. But then do we need everything implemented in our code? I'm sorry. Scale is always a complexity. Do we need scale right away? If you got a system to create that is going, that it has to handle five million users in five years, maybe it would be smarter to start with something smaller, but right away, and add scale with time. Um, be aligned or be open with your business partners. Better is the enemy of good. I'm not really sure this is a saying in English as well, but this is definitely one of my favorite sayings in Poland, in Polish. Uh, you can spend hours and hours looking into your code base, design, infrastructure, whatever it is you're doing, and think, it is not good enough, I can do better, I can make it better. Well, the truth is you probably can, but is it worth it? Um, is every technical debt worth paying? That's a, also a very fun question to ask yourself because from my experience, like it's always fun and it's, it's always worth to 
update the version of the framework that you are using. But then if you have a microservice or a method that is huge and ugly, but works, and you know well, you have plans for removing it pretty soon, is it worth investing time into refactoring it right now when you are going to delete it pretty soon? And, oh, that went faster than I expected. But now let's sum it all up. So what you can do is keeping your board nice and clean. This will also help cleaning your mind. Um, keep it simple, stupid. Do not add complexity when you don't, where you don't need it, where it doesn't belong. Think big, act small, break every big task into smaller pieces. Just enough it states about making decision with just enough knowledge to make it. Good is okay, you don't have to be perfect, nothing has to be perfect. And asking for, for help is also very okay. And there is nothing bad about asking for help. But if you are experiencing chronic stress, anxiety, or depression symptoms, please contact a specialist because uh, those things can help you, but uh, yeah, you probably need something a little bit more. And uh, I have to say special thanks to the creators of the icons because I'm not skilled enough to do them myself. So yeah, flat icon, thank you. And uh, yeah, that would be me. It was short and nice. If you would like, uh, to stay in touch or have any questions, you can contact me on LinkedIn or with email, and I invite you to check out our blog. As I said, not much going on right now, but we are working on changing that. Do you have any questions? Is there time for questions? There's always time for questions, of course. <laughs> yeah, but if you don't have anything and you think about it later, just... I, I have a question. Yeah. I haven't heard, can you repeat? I should probably speak to the microphone because <laughs> otherwise the people on stream wouldn't hear it. So uh, out of the, the topics that you covered, uh, which of these principles you actually applied in your daily jobs and uh, do you think they are effic efficient for you? Yeah, uh, I applied all of them, but the, as I said, the deal breaker for me was the thing, fig, thing big, act small. I actually have a story around that one. Um, I had in my career a few years back a system to create. And I was young and unexperienced, and I jumped into doing everything at once. So the design, infrastructure, cloud setting up, and starting with coding, it was bothersome. It was a terrible experience. And now what I learned from that time is that every time I have to do something big, I create a small, like a to-do list with a smaller tasks. And that's something that completely changed my approach. I know it's obvious, but if sometimes I feel like if you don't say obvious things, they, it's hard to put them in life. Any more questions, guys? Yeah, if you think about it, something, just I will be here and I'm available on LinkedIn. And Yay! Are you Thank you. Thanks a lot. So then it's again my turn. Uh, just give me a second with uh, too much stuff to handle. Can you hold this one? Thanks.
Yes, but finally, I think I figured it out. So, uh, have a clicker here. Uh, that was actually the presentation that I randomly had been uh, talking about uh, during the DevOps days. That was the conference that was in uh, Oslo in Centralen last time. And uh, they had this uh, super cool format that I want to try with us in the future as well, where you get uh, Ignite Karaoke. Do you guys know? Who, somebody knows Ignite Karaoke? No one knows. Okay. So that's a format when you basically get um, uh, slides that you don't know. So you just go, and it's like improv, but like business version of it. So you go and you look at the slide and you, you tell something, and you need to, to make up a story. So I liked it so much, and the, the actually the topic that I came up with was this one. So I expanded it slightly um, after that uh, first presentation and make it hopefully a little bit more straightforward and nice. Uh, but we will see on that. So uh, as you can see, uh, I'm a lot of, I'm like an open source uh, fan, really. I like open source software a lot and I use it uh, for many, many years. And I feel that um, Norwegian IT needs uh, more of it. So I'm going to tell you why. Uh, we're going to start uh, quite some time ago the, from ancient Greeks, which is like, it feels like it is connected to the topic, and it, uh, or maybe it's not connected, but it is really connected. So the, the ancient, in ancient Greece, you had the concept of free speech that was like, um, not invo invented, I guess, but at least it was like, <laughs> maybe not enforced, but it was used, right, uh, in, the, in the society back then. So freedom of expression and things like that. So if you actually look in the history, uh, the history tells us that we have all these nice guys uh, and they did a lot of nice things, right? Uh, really a lot and actually more of them and uh, even more of them. So do you actually know any other example of uh, like a civilization that in that short term had to lead to such huge number of people who was like really creative and interesting and made a lot of nice things. I think it's an interesting example. So, le le but let's back. Uh, let's go back in time to Norway and the current times. So, although Norway is one of the world's richest nations and uh, it is a huge user of IT equipment. It is still a relatively small producer of IT equipment. And I think here is actually not only about equipment, but also about software. Software is kind of equipment, you can uh, say that, right? So this is actually from a book of, uh, from a researcher. And uh, it stands out that uh, the rate is about 3 to 1. So basically, on three imported products, we get one exported product in here. And maybe, I don't know about other countries, maybe they have a similar thing, but I'm guessing US have better uh, ratio. Um, yeah, so was it like that all the time? I think it wasn't. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples here. You probably know, at least uh, Norwegians should know, I guess. That's like a nice piece of history, right? So Opera Software, uh, which was originally a local company. And it's been an innovative company that been doing a nice browser, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, web innovations that uh, was held in the in the in the company. And it's actually, uh, I think it forked from Telenor. Yeah, it forked from Telenor, so it was like internal lab or, lab or something. But then what happened in 2016? Uh, we probably some of us probably know uh, Chinese buys this Opera software and makes a gaming browser. Yay, gaming browser! And what else? Yeah, they did some innovation, of course, too, but um, still, that's first example. Second example, there's been such thing as Fast. So that was like a search engine. And uh, yeah, it was sort of growing that time. And of course, it got eventually bought by Microsoft. So that's uh, another story. And then th there is Funcom, which is a gaming company. Also Norwegian and I think Finnish as well. They have a lot of uh, nice game, gaming products. And they are Tencent. They're Chinese. So Trolltech, QT. Uh, well, this is actually a cross-platform tool, right? So if you're a de developer, you probably know it. It is awesome. Uh, it's used everywhere. And it is being developed in Norway. 
then it got sold or bought uh, by Finland and by Microsoft and then back back and forth for several times with through Nokia I think yeah it, it was go going through Nokia so again of course we're we're not in US this time but yeah the same thing basically so this leads me to thinking that we need to do something to make Norway better science hub a great science hub and it can be because it's a great location it's great weather it's great people it's well, well there's no downsides almost the probably the only downsides is lack of um, sort of uh, activities and also understanding of course understanding of what is open source why should we use it why we should should we promote it and uh, you know how actually apple and microsoft happened to capture the market they used uh, bdsm so and if you think about something else this is just a business development sales and marketing so they use it a lot especially the marketing part and apple uses uh, a lot uh, too and uh, they keep on doing it for pretty long time and, and to be fair it's not only in norway it's everywhere it happens like that in many many countries but i think here is more pronounced so this is a problem so how would we do that how would we convert norway back to nice science hub that it was uh, some time ago so i think we should educate people that's like the very very important uh, thing to do we should tell everyone what is open source and why it's important and uh, speak about it more and also we need to uh, educate people that actually the default choice is not always the right one and unfortunately you have to educate yourself sometimes and uh, learn how to do things how to you know just research do some research and uh, learning and of course sometimes you might need help because you might get stuck in this decision process uh, but the, the best part there are communities that can help you there are all all over the place there are online there are offline and there's more of them uh, than ever before so just uh, get the help basically of course there's going to be some uh, roadblocks and uh, the roadblocks right now uh, i feel is the government that actually is doing some weir weird things let's say they made education paid now for foreigners right that's gonna stop well that's already stopped actually uh, i al already know like at least five people who were on the way to norway and they decided not to go because now it's uh, impossible for them to uh, get this education because it's paid uh of course uh yeah the life is not cheap this is probably we can't do anything about that and that's actually i have a di different talk i will do it someday about concept that actually high prices is good and you should sustain high prices and you should just drive the salaries up but still for people who don't have high prices and who don't have high salaries that could be a roadblock uh then of course you need to keep on educating people again what is digital hygiene how to use it and apply it and uh, well you should try to do something against this uh, bdsm institute uh, maybe use their own tricks and uh, that's what i'm doing now yeah um but of course uh that's like the theoretical part and uh, i think uh, with all these uh, important steps if we combine them together we can uh, become a leader uh, it leader or tech leader and there are some important steps that are uh, done by Norwegian companies now for instance one X is making robotics there is a, a lot of innovation but uh, I feel it is a little bit uh, separated so we kind of need to throw everything uh, together into one large pot and uh, boil it until it uh, is ready so let's go a little bit to the practice uh, side of things there are some common misconceptions um, like some people say right some people say that's we hear it often we hear these points often so i want to a little bit uh, make a like a small education here and um, go around misconceptions on the open source software so i i actually gonna go through each of the points so uh some people say that it's not used widely or it's not popular and of course uh, it is correct to some extent but uh, if you consider that all your well almost all your phones are android based and that is a linux kernel and almost all the world web servers are linux based and just the servers in general a lot of them 
And there are so many nice open source products that are used globally like by huge margins and huge shares of the companies. Then it's not really true. So it is, it is popular. You can also see like, you know, probably know WordPress, right? And PostgreSQL and MySQL, and there's databases, there's CMSs, there's uh, operating systems, there's everything. Now it's even more than before. And literally it's, it's really hard to figure out a tool that is not open source. I mean, that the like area of tools that is not open source. You just have to search basically. And to emphasize on that even more, that's like a super small part of the market. This is super, super small. So this may be 10% of what is open source or less. So you can imagine this 10 times or more. And that's probably not everything yet, still. Uh, the next point is people say that it's hard to start using free software. But is it really? My mother uses Manjaro for pretty long. And my grandmother used Ubuntu and Manjaro as well. My grandmother. And actually, uh, there is this guy that made a YouTube video. Uh, the presentation will be available online, so you, you, can, you can visit and watch it's an uh, eight minutes video. Awesome video. He almost made a YouTube video that I wanted to make, so I'm not making it probably <laughs> so far. So he is saying that Linux is actually easier to learn nowadays. And uh, that's due to several reasons. First of all, it's more logical. And uh, also, it's, it's like built for people by people. So in the modern world, it's actually easier. And yes, you have like a little bit of learning curve, but that's the best part. You are not expected to go into it without knowledge. Because you know, if you take a hammer and you use it without knowledge, you might damage yourself easily, hurt yourself, right? But if you see how people use hammer one, two times, right? You use five minutes, then you will know how to use it and you will try and eventually you will get there. So the same with Linux, there is a little bit of learning curve, but the same goes for Windows and, and for Mac and other systems, right? But uh, with Windows, people tend to just take and use it without knowing it. And that's the bad thing about any OS. You should never do that. Not with Windows, not with Linux, not with any other OS. You should learn the basics. And basics are usually basics, right? They're super quick to learn. So they're not really hard. So if you're not a developer, but you want to try, definitely do that. So best advice, spend some time Try to play with it, you know, destroy it, make a VM, uh, just, you know, play with it. So I feel that people lost interest in breaking things and trying things, but we learn this way. We learn this way. Uh, and people are keeping losing interest in learning, and I guess we need uh, some sort of expert about that so he can tell us why is that happening. Is that because social networks are overtaking our lives? Is that because people are disconnecting for some reason or because of something else? Or it's a complexity of factors? I don't know. So another point is that there are no alternative tools. Let's say you go to alternative2.net, I think, right? And you just type, you know, Photoshop. You've got 233 alter alternatives. You type Cubase and you get 74. You get a Logic Pro. You get a Microsoft Office. You get whatever you want. And uh, most of these software are free and open source. Some of them just open source. Some of them also free. So it's actually quite, uh, quite a big, uh, quite huge community. And I would say last time I checked Fedora repos, it was about 250,000 packages and about the same number for Arch repos. So that says. Let's say every second package is a program, so that stands about 125,000 programs. Do you have a certain uh, centralized location in Windows where you can download 125,000 of programs? No, you don't. You have Microsoft Store where you probably can download maybe 100, couple of hundred apps of out of which most you don't want. Anyway, uh, Linux are not fun or open source are not fun. Is it really? So Valve is working on fixing that. That's one of examples. Of course, not only Valve is working on fixing that, a lot of companies do. But Valve really fixed it. So let's say six, seven, eight years ago, we had Wine where we could run some games, especially older titles, with no problems. Nowadays, I have Steam library of about one and, th one and a half thousand games. I love gaming, so. And uh, I think two or three are not running on Linux. and. Uh, 
all the rest are running. So it's only a question if you need to just click a button or if you might need to do some adjustments uh, for it to run. But it's getting better and Valve is doing everything to make it as possible just single click and play games. So it's as fun as anything else basically and I would definitely say that it's more fun than consoles because it gets more games. So you get the games from Epic Games, you get the games from Steam, you get the games from a little bit from PlayStation ports, right? And so you get more games in general. Then some people say that it's not used in production, which is also not true. I don't even need to <laughs> probably elaborate on that more. You know that it is r really used in production a lot. And I've worked in the uh, last two companies and we have so many technologies, about 400, uh, I think I counted about 400 technologies, out of which about 370 are open source. And then 30 are proprietary. And these 30 are usually like hardware stacks that we have in Rex, we had in Rex in the company. So that's, that's uh, specifics. Then some people say that it's uh, not used in commerce or that you can't use it in commerce, but you can actually. And there are uh, certain types of licenses that you can use if you want to commercialize on your open source products. So you can sell it if you want. You can sell subscriptions, you can sell the cloud version, you can do, you can do a multiple things and you can do donations, of course. So there are ways of earning money and there is a lot of commercial stuff as well. Some people also say that it is a lower quality. And uh, when the project starts, doesn't matter if it's open source or closed source, it will be low quality. But when it evolves, if it obtains enough contributors, it will grow and it will improve and that's what's happening. You can look at uh, different examples, and there are many of them, uh, of a great quality software that is open source. You probably all know these programs, and there's, uh, there's like a small recap of some of them. I'm going to go, go back to that uh, in the future. Some people also say that it's less secure, right? And that's just a misconception. Uh, basically, the more people work on it, the more people can check the source code. And of course, not everybody is a developer. That's totally fine. But a lot of people are, and some of, some people are, let's say 10%. And then out of this 10%, let's say 2 3% maybe will really uh, work with you on your code, will help you to improve it. So you are actually getting a more secure code. Then also some people say it lacks support. We just discussed Valve case when it's not not the case, and then it's actually a thing with a lot of like scanners, printers, hardware that on Linux you get a support forever, basically like a scanner with the LPT port if you still remember that, a huge one. They still often work, while on a modern device or on a modern platforms uh, with some modern OS, let's say Windows 10, right? Uh, some of them are not supported anymore, and the only way around it either trash it and buy a new one or find an alternative vendor that helps you to fix it. So actually, uh, there's also a lot of support, not only of the, uh, from the side of um, supporting hardware, but also from the community side. So if you need to help with anything, you just go to the forums. It has a great documentation, so you can read it through. So there's a lot of support. And in my uh, personal um, chats with different sort of supports, I, I talked to open source projects and out of there, there would, was super nice experiences, medium experiences and somewhat not good experiences. But then I, talk, uh, I would also talk about proprietary support. Now I'm talking about something that we actually paid to get. So we bought licenses for some uh, systems that we used. And uh, I contacted a couple of companies and uh, the best of them was mediocre. But most of them was non-answering, non-existent, not helpful at all, and answering a different question. Like I'm asking one, they are, they are answering differently. So, and that was the case really, really often. And I think this comes to that open source have to grow through people. There's no other way other than to grow through people. And the proprietary software does not have to do that because it can grow through either marketing, it can grow through, you know, you, you, maybe you are making special program for one use case, in particular case, and you know you get a customers. Maybe, I don't know, you're writing a source code for a submarine or something. So then you, of course, you can sell your software, but this is like, uh, it's still better to collaborate and uh, there is a lot of support and trust me, it is better. In most of the communities, it is better. And that's an example. Uh, Grafana Labs, right? So that's like one community that grow up from scratch and uh, maybe you know the system that's like a, a 
graphical representation of your databases or your data ingests or whatnot, whatever you want. So it's super flexible, super nice. And this is what you see in the footer of the website. So would you say that this is a bad documentation or lack of support? I wouldn't call it that. And that's, of course, one of the examples, but there are many similar ones. There is another saying that uh, this is only can be used for niche applications. But it's actually both ways. Proprietary software can be used for niche applications, and there's not really, it, there's no real direct connection. So it can be sometimes, of course. But it is actually powering a wide range of devices. So if you look at this chart, right, this is like a, just a, an example, but this is like a family of distributions. And uh, nowadays it's over a thousand of them. And each of the distribution is targeted to some market or markets, right? So actually, I wouldn't say it is targeting niche applications, although some of the distributions do, but most of them are just general. So for daily use, like this laptop is having Garuda on it, for instance. Okay, so uh, some people says that open source is only about software. No, I don't agree with that. Uh, let's go back to the example with the Greece, the ancient Greece, right? So actually open source, I feel it should be a framework and it should be proposed to people as a framework, as a design framework, right? So whatever you're designing, is it a hardware? Is it software? Is it a combination? Is it something else? Is it a concept? or something entirely different. It should be open source because without being open, you can't get a feedback or enough, let's say enough feedback. You cannot grow you and you just in general, it's just a stupid thing to do. <laughs> At least I feel so. And uh, there's a lot of projects that uh, stands on this idea of you doing open source hardware. There's even more and more and more now. I have not put this as example, but there's framework laptops, it's called Frame.work is the domain name, so you can check it out. There's MNT Reform, that's a completely open source laptop as well. So, and these are also modular and they look uh, better or the same, let's say, as uh, MacBooks do. So, uh, can you do a modular design, open source, that is slim and nice to use for every day? Yes, you can. So, hardware, possible, existing, and yeah, just you should use it. Also, some people say that it is less innovative, but then again, it goes back to the previous points that I already talked about, right? The collaboration point and the support point. For instance, uh, you might know Martin. That's Martin here. Uh, he's, a, he's a Swedish guy. He's an international guy. He made this uh, marble machine. Uh, this is Marble Machine X, uh, Machine X, which is the second version. He made uh, two versions so far. And uh, the thing is, he made the first machine that failed because, well, he made some YouTube videos and he got famous. I think he got over a million subscribers on a couple of channels. So, but that's a, that's a separate story. But he failed with the first machine. He wanted to play on a stage with these machines, but it was not working. So he made a second version, which is on this uh, screenshot. So he added a lot of metal metal parts. But he also failed with it because it was not working, because it was such a complex project to handle on yourself. This is actually coming back um, to the previous presentation about uh, separating pieces, right, and KISS principles, which are awesome. And he did not use the KISS principles. So what he did uh, at the point when he was working on this machine, he got already he got uh, over a million subscribers. So what he did, he channeled all these people force into making his dream come true. His dream was to make a machine that he can travel with and play music on. So how he did it, he made a Discord server and he just invited everybody to join and collaborate. So the Marble Mach Mission 3 that's going to be hopefully coming together soon is being developed right now and it is a completely different machine. It is like a huge, it has a, it is huge but it's simpler. So it is larger but it is simpler. And uh, we hope to see him one day on, on the stage. But that's basically how you can say that it is actually more innovative when you take the community power and use it uh, deliberately. So I'm hoping you are convinced now about <laughs> open source and its use cases. Oh, by the way, let's, let's get some feedback. Who guys are uh, using open source like on a daily basis? Uh, okay, half hands, I guess. Uh, who also 
uh, uses like let's say Linux distros on his machines a bit less hands but still some okay that's great so so I guess the, the rest who have not lifted uh, their hands um, you can uh, try it if you if you want you can get help and um, you can you know explore um, so returning back to the original topic so the scientific approach to developing any object is to do it openly right so and science has been like that for ages right and the patents actually was created originally not to um, like get this huge companies that uh, troll people with the patents right but instead they was created to protect authors but they were na they weren't able to never ever so we should just forget that was a broken idea or maybe that was not broken idea but that was broken people or broken broken implementation I don't know but still patents doesn't work so instead of patents you should go the other way and say this will be a public domain or okay if you don't want to go public domain route you can say it will be something else but still it is better to develop openly and I'm hoping that open source framework is uh, the framework you're gonna choose when you are working on the next project so um, again how can we compete how can we popular popularize this uh, should we do some sort of I don't know there is there are some communities online let's say this one uh, which is actually I think not active anymore but they have been active for over 10 years and there are different movements that are trying to implement open source methodologies in everything and I think we should think more about it maybe even use viral licenses like GPL because when you use GPL you are enforcing everybody who who will use your product as parts of it to have GPL as well, right? So this is a viral viral license that grows like a virus, and uh, that's good about it. That's that's a good thing. That's a viral. So maybe we should think more about using GPL. I don't know. I personally I prefer public domain, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should uh, create some sort of fun symbols that we could use. I don't know. That could be an idea, and some companies used it and tried it and uh, I guess it works to some extent but then would be nicer if we have some support from governments and like official sort of official support so we can use sort of some some sort of symbols and there's been uh, my own attempts to like popularize open source for for quite a long time so I have some examples here so this is a this is actually a Polish company that uh, produces these metal plates you can uh, add any graphics on it. So I just uh, did the logos of uh, favorite, uh, my, some of my favorite uh, products, uh, open source products. So I did several designs. And uh, I think this is like one way of doing it, but I have not seen a lot of people doing it. Uh, FOSDEM is probably the only place when you, where you see people doing it all the time. And other than FOSDEM, maybe a couple of other conferences, but it's not that, it's not in the, uh, you know in the etiquette so to say i think open source should be an etiquette thing so if you are like a good person you should just do that this way uh, and then attempts of other people uh, some successful some less successful uh, some books are published and the manifestos of course and a lot of graphics nice nice things maybe the only problem is that people are maybe a little bit uh, not convinced to share stuff anymore. I don't know, maybe they are a little bit tired from social networks and a lot of content. And this one, actually, I made this slide with the <laughs> ChatGPT. Um, so uh, I asked ChatGPT, what do you think? Why open source is important? And uh, the answer was pretty nice, so I just put it on the slide. So basically, with open source, you get a lot of accessibility features you get one of the best accessibility features and you can check it out uh, easily online uh, as i already told about some of these topics i will skip them and of course it is great just ethically great and uh, it is human centric as well so i think we should promote it more collaborate report bugs uh, join conferences ask questions learn educate blah 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 do some speeches and develop our own projects in open source methodology and the last thing to speak here about is probably licensing uh, i already covered a little bit of that but uh, basically we should promote free licenses um, not all people know about them and not all people care 
but I think that's something to care about. So there is public domain, there is uh, WTFPL, you can check what that means if you want. There is unlicensed, there is CC0, and there are viral licenses, they're slightly more limiting. So the public domain is do whatever you want, you can earn money, you can do whatever. And the sum of, th of them are a little bit more limiting, and the others are strict, like GPL version 3, I think the most strict of them. But the knowledge should be free, and uh, I feel we should port this idea out of knowledge to all the other areas of our lives. And uh, again, returning to the commercial question, can we actually earn with open source? Yes, we can. That's the uh, last uh, misconception I'm going to talk about. And a lot of companies did it successfully. Grafana Labs, for instance, or Canonical, or Red Hat, or a lot of other companies are doing it, and it is totally possible. Red Hat is actually in this building. Uh, and you can talk to these guys. They're also hosting some conferences, some talks. And a lot of interesting ideas are there. And uh, that's just like a scratching the surface of what open source can do for you. And I hope you are excited as I am. So uh, some useful links uh, that I personally love to visit. So first two are the websites where you can check alternatives for your favorite software. Um, then you also have news, of course, news about hardware, news about uh, software, news about distributions. And then uh, most of the AI, actually, the AI developments are open source. And that's the only way to do it. Because if we don't do it open source, we don't know what's going to happen with, the, with all this AI research. So we'd better make AI, you know, <laughs> open source AI that kills us than the closed source AI that kills us. <laughs> well, hopefully it does not kill us even, but we'll see. <laughs> so that's it for my talk. Hope that was not too long. You already know my name and my socials. So let's move to the right away. Do you guys feel you need a five minute pause or you wanna continue straight away? Who wanna who want a small pause? Uh, okay, seven, eight, and who wanna continue? Okay, we will make a small pause. Uh, just five minutes and then we will have a last presentation. And it is it should be awesome. It's a different format. Uh, than that and after that we will also have a networking that's even better than everything <laughs> hopefully and it will be in the scrap landed which is the bar in the basement and the only way out of this building is through that bar so <laughs> please join us and if you don't want to join us you'll still have to go through the bar <laughs> okay thanks for your attention and uh, five minutes pause and then very soon
this, so it's going to be easier. It's a bit of a... Uh, yeah, because the building is closed. It's such a reason I didn't know that. So they will let us still use it. You feel you feel it it was fine?
talk to her after. I'll this will be short. Are we all back? Oh, I had my mic on all the time. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> so, Jonathan, you ready? Ready, steady to talk? Uh, yes, I will. Just give me a second and uh, take that one. And I will remove this one. Right now. Right now. Uh, hello, hello, yeah. Yep, perfect. All righty, uh, let's do this one. It's uh, not a not very long one, and uh, this is like the most exciting format. <laughs> so, Jonathan. We've been uh, knowing each other for quite a while now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, please uh, start. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan and um, I, I've been enjoying this uh, so, uh, so much so far. And I really liked your presentation and both of you, the things you said is very, makes sense for, for me also, a part of my story, I think. Uh, so my crypto story actually started uh, with uh, you then, more or less, I would say. I was kind of testing out some uh, trading before that, and then you uh, told me that uh, why don't I just build uh, my own uh, miner? So I did with the help from you, yep. and it uh, became quite a big uh, hobby, I would say. Uh, it still uh, partly is, and um, yeah, I think uh, we can just uh, start. So I just push yep. the next one. Yep. Okay, the bottom one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, basically, yeah, well, this is just an intro slide that uh, I, I removed my picture, so because you've seen all, <laughs> me all over the place so, so many times, so we can just go to the next one. Uh, previous one. Yeah, you, you should probably click and I will yeah. put this away. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I, when I wrote this, uh, I, I was not really sure what to, to, to present, so I just put some uh, keywords. Uh, like uh, to present myself, I'm Jonathan, and um, yeah, I, my life. This is kind of my life story. So I started off being quite shy when I was young, kind of to myself. Um, um, gamer is there also. I was playing uh, like Nintendo and all these things. I grew up with uh, Windows and floppy disks and uh, call up uh, what do you call them? Call dial-up uh, modems. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're already all, uh, has always been uh, interested in, in, in tech to some degree. I'm also interested in exploring things, uh, meditation, and through my life I've become more and more kind of extrovert. Um, yeah, and I like to keep things simple. And, um, and um, yeah, I, I, I do a lot of philosophy also uh, on my own. So um, yeah, I think we can just go forward from the, this one. Yeah, so I wouldn't occupy a lot of time. I've already told a lot about my <laughs> biography to you guys. So I get one point for you, one extra point for you. So I'm, I'm vegetarian, so let's go to the next one. Yeah. All my life, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also vegetarian, actually. I grew up as a vegetarian. Now I'm uh, vegan together with my wife. And, uh, and uh, yeah. So. More nice concepts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a good. I think I, I like to see how everything kind of fits together and and uh, kind of my personal kind of ideology and kind of I like to do things that make sense to me and also that kind of I think is also providing something to others. Um, since I was young, I like to pick things apart. It kind of goes back to the open hardware part that you talked about. I like to understand how things. Um, worked. Um, when I was young, I wanted to be an inventor. I, I didn't become that. <laughs> but uh, Yet. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm inventing ideas and, exactly. and, and, and trying to, to do, do something uh, better with things. Uh, I did gaming for a while. I, I still enjoyed gaming. Now I don't have the time for it. I kind of switched it into to crypto and more, more software um, focus. 
Um, yeah, I like to fantasize, philosophize, and think about how life is and it could be, or kind of the meaning of everything. Uh, I like exploring people, volunteer in nature. I, I spend a, a lot of time out in nature, also in uh, winter time and, and uh, summer time. So I, I, I like to think that I'm kind of diverse and, and do a lot of things. I also play the piano and, and uh, yeah. So maybe next time we do a, a new a new way of uh, doing speeches with uh, actually li like like they used to do the movies, you know. On the, on the last uh, crypto event I I attended, I actually played the piano also in the. Yeah, so that <laughs> is that is a new interesting format that we're exploring already. You see that works <laughs> even on the stage; it wor yeah, it's working. Yeah. So for me. Um, yeah, maybe not mentioning the previous ones. It's 3D printing and modeling. That's something I've been doing throughout many years, and I return to it uh, yet again. And right now, it's super nice. It was when I started it, it was like a mess, and now it is. It's super easy to get on board and to start 3D printing and modeling, and you can do it completely with open source software too. And then DIY stuff, but basically that's connected to 3D printing a lot. Um, for, uh, yeah, basically making friends, meeting people, networking, gaming, learning new things, of course, traveling. Uh, I have not been traveling lately, but before that I've been to almost 30 countries and I'm hoping to get to all of them So throughout my life. So I need to get into the pace, basically. Um, then speaking about other uh, stuff, science fiction, probably also a common thing. Yeah. And uh, working with startups and with crypto and also music and art festivals. Is, uh, are awesome. There is a screenshot from FOSDAM and uh, I invite you all to join its awesome event, both same format, online and offline. You don't have to fly to Brussels if you don't, but it's, it's, it's actually very simple to fly there. So you could as well, you know, go there. <laughs> Your turn. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I started off trying to become an electrician. I d that didn't happen. Uh, but I learned a lot of things that was, I think was useful. It was a friend of mine, he told me to to maybe st study and go into electronics because he saw how I like to make uh, electronic devices at home from when I was very young. Uh, and I worked in kindergarten, I was in the, I, I wrote Air Force, it's like the, just for the months that you have to be there. Um, I've been working on myself a lot. Um, I, I've, I've also do some presentations of my life journey also uh, in regard of that. I, I spent a lot. I spent a lot of time working in uh, humanitarian uh, organizations as a volunteer, mostly. And uh, on my daytime, I work with the psychiatric health and addiction um, for the for the municipality. And and um, what I see then regard to the open source, for example, I ask them sometimes why they don't use open source for their computer systems, and uh, they they kind of answer the same that uh, that. Um, it's they they're technicians they they the IT guys they don't know it, and then uh, I try to explain. But uh, you have so much expenses with software. Why don't you put it into hiring someone that actually knows it and then can use those money to, to something else? And also, it's a common fact that actually, uh, if you hire somebody who knows it well, you need less people that can do more things. Yeah. But uh, people, for some reason, thinking that they're going to buy five paid programs and then it's going to be sold automatically without any people involvement. And you still need people involvement anyways. Yeah. And, and there's, the most, like you say, most people, they don't really realize how, how broad uh, open source is and how, yeah. how it's actually keeping all the electronics and, and devices together. Yeah. Yeah, I have some pictures here. One from uh, when I was working dur during co COVID just so we can see that, uh, kind of there uh, with the mask and everything like we were supposed to. The other picture is um, me and a colleague. I was actually buying two chairs uh, at Finn and I was carrying them home and I uh, um, co coincidentally met my colleague after, after work. So we just sat down and had a talk and, I, and uh, just to, yeah, we, 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 we have a good time when we work together. So. Uh, we do those. We can do these kind of things, and it was only us two. So uh, I asked some random person to take a picture of us just to documentate this. So it was kind of a fun thing, and I, I would I like to. I think it. that uh, would be a cool tradition also to do that. You know, yeah. you just uh, go with a chair somewhere, put it somewhere, and just talk to people. Yeah, that that's that would be a fun, fun thing. Yeah, to that, do. that could be a streaming by itself. Yeah. No, so I like to also do uh, do these kind of things. I host some events also in Oslo. I'm I'm also been into car surfing and and uh, 
and these social events. And uh, I think that a lot of kind of importance is also kind of uh, to include people and, and, and teach people things. It's kind of a kind of very good skill to, to uh, promote. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I already told you a little bit about it. Um, I worked uh, in several companies, but I will skip to probably... Yeah, we had, for instance, this was the, on the um, photos to the right. Uh, these were the metal case that we developed for the miners that we were putting for our clients. That was quite a fun project. And uh, I also developed board games. I, yeah, I just... Uh, I have a lot of different work that I've been doing, uh, both for uh, like for money and just for fun, and in different communities. And uh, hopefully, the list will continue to grow, and there will be more awesome stuff in the future. Yeah, software. I kind of started talking a little bit about that when I kind of started with Windows when it was quite new, and and with the floppy disks, it was kind of a struggle sometimes, and sometimes they stopped working. And uh, I remember the first browsers like Opera, like you talked about, uh, and how they <laughs> loaded like very slowly, but but they loaded. And I remember also the yeah the chat rooms. I didn't in right here, but the torrent also when it came uh, a bit later. And um, yeah, I I. I it's funny when you think of it now that kind of how it was then, and then now how it will be in the next generations also. So um, yeah, I, I I like software. Like I, I like to take things apart. I also like to understand how things are working. I got into open source. Um, I I enjoyed building computer servers. That's kind of why it was easy for me also to understand the the mining concept. Um, and I've been kind of switching between Debian and Ubuntu. I, I really enjoy that. And Ubuntu has this kind of slogan that's... Um, um, humanity to others? Yeah, huma humanity to others, exactly. Which is like Ubuntu itself is like a word, uh, a fra phrase of being kind and giving and hosp uh, hospi uh, hospitality. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and yeah, basically huma humanity to others. And I think the concept with open source and also open hardware is kind of part of that. We need to bring that also into the tech world where, where we kind of pre we give the options for everyone to get the software where they need to learn things. There's a lots and lots of learning equipment for schools. Uh, I, when I did some schooling, uh, as an adult, they, were, they had Linux also with a lot of systems. Uh, I really enjoyed to see that. And I think focusing on that and building that, not only in countries where people don't can afford these softwares mostly, but also here where we are rich, will also kind of create a broader span for, uh, for everyone to, to, to access it and also, and also provide the help to each other. And I think it's very important to kind of bring uh, humanity also into the to the software world. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, so for for the, for my side, I decided to go with the, with the uh, OS instead of software. Uh, but uh, basically, it's connected, right? So uh, I started uh, using computer in computers in '97. That was Windows '95, and it was on CDs, I believe. And uh, after that, um, I think I used WinNT for some time. And actually, I used Mille Millennium for a lot of people hated it, but I liked it for some reason for some time. And a lot of people liked XP, but I never liked really XP. So I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm a weird guy. But after that, uh, about 2007, I got a friend who showed me a Mandrake Linux. And I also heard about Fedora something, Fedora Core, it was called at that back, that, back then. And I started exploring and uh, couple of months after I just switched and at, at that time it was uh, of course it was a bit more rough but it also was more exciting in, 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 in that sense that you have to learn more to be able to use it but when when you learn more you are more capable right yeah. so yeah then uh, basically I had a lot of distribution switches between Fedora Ubuntu and several others but I ended up in Arch and I tried to, to use Gen2 and NixOS but it feels for me such sort of awkward and NixOS is super nice for business but I'm not a business user myself right I'm not uh, for private use I don't see it but for business use maybe NixOS is the best but for myself I stuck to Arch and then when I seen that Manjaro is actually going away 
kind of Ubuntu did. We went away from Debian and Manjaro went away from Arch. So I stopped using it and uh, moved to Garuda, which is almost clean Arch with some small uh, additions. Of course, I also looked at different other OSs because I wanted to see if there's any other interesting cases. Uh, and I used uh, FreeBSD on a couple of network devices, of course, and other uh, OSs, but I never used them too much. And I feel Solaris is an interesting, another interesting example uh, of OS that could be used in data center environment. But for uh, uh, usual, <laughs> usual normal people, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the case. Yeah, so I, uh, ideology, like I kind of started a little bit before, I think it's also important to bring in because I think also open source I uh, ideology is kind of um, kind of also part of the human aspect of, of uh, being, um, yeah, uh, considerate and, and uh, including to, to everyone. And uh, yeah, I will not say the words here, but it kind of makes sense, I think, also inside of this or open source. Yeah, ideology. Yeah, yeah. I think all of these key points are connected to the open source as I had a scheme in the last slide. These yeah. are all, all interconnected. So my ideologies are very, very similar. I just tend to formalize them differently because I like to promote good things. And uh, I'm a crypto anarchist and meritocrat, and uh, I'm also from uh, Church of. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm like an advocate of the flying spaghetti monster. So I, I like science th uh, things, and I like to debunk myths about different things as well. And uh, yeah, I also like music and some, some uh, serious heavy stuff. So, in that regard, um, I think that also puts a certain vibe into my soul, so to say. But I like to, um, to like go a little bit beyond the border to try to explain to people that all these things that they are usually afraid of, they're actually really nice. And uh, when you go into them, and like when you talk to a crypto anarchist, for example, you, it sounds kind of bad, right? But when you talk to them, they're the nicest guy that guys that, that are exist there. For instance, the guys from Liberstadt or any other uh, community like that. So you don't realize until you go and talk to them. So you should do yeah. it more. I, 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 I can I, I can agree. I'm I'm not uh, into some of those things so much, but I'm I, I like to play pool. Uh, so I go to bars sometimes and play pool. And in Oslo, one of the best places to go is to a heavy heavy rock bar to play. They're kind of the best players there at the moment, I think. And I think the people there are like so different from kind of general people who don't have any experience with them. Uh, that uh, they are maybe even more soft and, and accessible, I think, as humans. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's move to the original. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I got, when I made this rep representation, I kind of got lost a little bit. But yeah, so getting into crypto is um, is uh, I put the, the image of the language cafe there on the side, uh, which is actually where we talked about uh, the mining for the first time. That's yes. Uh, I think it was either Language Cafe or uh, it Cafe was Language that, Cafe that yeah. we met yeah. Yeah. the first time also. And um, there's an image of me when I was in Barcelona at Smartcom. I have the sponsor bag badge. I was very proud of that. Uh, I could go everywhere I wanted in, in, in uh, down there. I was represent, representing Alvi Chain. Um, so uh, yeah, it was very exciting. It was my first kind of big international uh, crypto event and. Um, and it kind of got me triggered. I liked it, also I joined one later in London, and and uh, I kind of uh, since I also have my own project, uh, I see the need of connecting also not only through uh, to through the internet. Uh, so uh, yeah, I have my um, yeah the interest. I I, I tried to trade a little bit uh, a few years ago, and then uh, yeah, I got into the 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 mining, and I really enjoyed that. I tried. Bitcoin mining, which was not so fun and a bit more difficult, I would say. It was more simple to do the GPU mining, and I could kind of play with the things if something went wrong. So it was kind of much easier to to uh, to handle, I think. Uh, and, uh, Can you elaborate more on the stress point in this slide? Uh, yeah, the st the <laughs> I mean, I think for everyone that are into crypto, for some um, some in some kind of way, there's a lot of stress. Um, either from the development side or from the investment side, uh, or both. Or both, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Personally, I'm I'm kind of both because I have my own project and I also invest. Uh, so I feel a bit uh, 
of that stress sometimes. But I, I, I also enjoy kind of that also. It's for me also a bit fun also, I think. Yeah. But also there is another side of that when you're into crypto and then there is also FOMO all around you and all the people yeah, yeah, yeah. who are uh, yeah. fearing of missing out yeah. and uh, running around and like, have you checked Bitcoin today? Have you yeah, checked yeah, yeah, Ethereum yeah. today? Like, yeah. And uh, it, it is also stressful in a way, right? Because you need to like manage... You, are you want to be FOMO uh, guy or are you want to just keep it simple, right? And just put it, put it somewhere? The most, the most simple, I think, is to, when you invest in crypto, not to have a specific date where you want to take or need to take it out. You invest because you believe in the principle and, and the idea and that it will go uh, well, uh, but not that you need a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time that will only create, create stress, I think, for one. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, yeah, lack of understanding. I mean, when, when I talk with people uh, that don't know me, it's like, I'm a little bit careful with the crypto part. I usually say it just because I like to expose also that, that uh, part of me. Uh, but it's like uh, people are kind of thinking differently about things. And um, yeah, so it went from the mining thing and then I kind of also did a more investment, I think, after I did uh, the mining because then I earned Ethereum that I could invest and it was kind of fun also, well, at least uh, when I was doing it in the beginning. Now it's kind of more, um, I started to understand the principle of it that it takes time and there's like not, uh, it goes up and down uh, like this. Uh, so yeah, I wrote MetaMask there also because it's kind of a different concept from the beginner of crypto where, it kind of, where you kind of have to understand the different blockchains and how to operate between them. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's not for everyone and it's very hard to, to make it accessible uh, for, uh, in, in a decentralized way. Interesting. Could argue on that point, but uh, <laughs> let's continue. Yeah, I know from, from, from what you said earlier, but uh, I, uh, yeah. Partially, partially, I agree. Yeah. Uh, some some projects, though, they're doing really good in becoming accessible for yeah. uh, general public. Yeah, and you can centralize it with the option for decentralization also. Yeah, G hybrid model. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah, can go to next. Um, myself, um, basically, it was uh, a lot of different fun stories. I will tell you maybe a couple of them. So I've started crypto from the very beginning. So I've seen it around 2009, 2010. But I was not investing anything uh, back then. So I was just reading articles and looking into it. And was just in general interested. But uh, look at it one or two times, several times. And that basically was it. But later, uh, second ep epoch, uh, about 2014, 2015, uh, I started actually investing and I started to participate in a lot of events. So I would mention IBCG, uh, awesome community that actually where I met uh, Vitalik Buterin and he was not a guy that people knew by, by then, back then. And that picture uh, on the left is actually uh, one of uh, the projects that's like, uh, there was I think two or three of them and one of, the, of them was bor uh, burned and uh, this was sold on the very interesting auction so basically they put it to sale for ethereum and they sold it for half million us um, but when they when they get to sell it they said they will not sell it so they they said no to half a million dollar which was pretty strange so i just make a photo with this um, um, nice picture so i remember about that story another uh, story i can tell you is that uh, this is my friend mike you probably seen him on another photos maybe and uh, this is a, like um uh, power station that we work together. We help them to build a couple of containers with the miners, with ventilation, uh, security, and uh, like it's like about several thousand GPUs. So that was like the large scale project and it went so well. I think they are still there and they are still working. Maybe they are updated and uh, mining something else, but it was quite fun. And of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, different uh, projects from community like uh, Monero wallet or hardware wallets that are uh, that lead lead the way to the crypto for many people. For myself personally, I don't use hardware wallets, but um, I feel that's uh, that's one of the uh, simple entry points uh, to crypto. It could be. Yeah, and using skills like kind of what I said. Also, I think. Uh, um, connecting and talking with people is important also in this, especially because it's kind of a, even though it's so established in the community, even that, uh, yeah, uh, already kind of invisible, 
it's all it's uh, important to connect with people and talk about it, make people aware. Um, transparency, I think, is super important also in crypto. Um, the the need for transparency in crypto is kind of uh, the essence of it all, but it's kind of uh, a lot of people kind of forget that part of it, and I think it's important to to maintain that and, and promote it, and and curiosity, create curiosity for it, and and and. Um, and yeah, I have an image from when I went to one of the mountains in uh, in um, in Norway. It's kind of um, how how crypto can be like a mountain to to climb, uh, but then when you have done it, it will be an accomplishment that you will bring with you for the rest of your life. And uh, this is from London when we were there. There's a piano in the background you don't see, but uh, that's where we were playing the piano. And there's uh, one guy from. Um, from CryptoLink Tech, and then there's some guys from uh, Alvichain and me, uh, and some other people in the background. So, yeah, we were enjoying it very much uh, a few months. So, ago. so the conferences um, are the most exciting part for you, right? Uh, that you joined lately yeah, in crypto. Yeah, yeah. This, this, uh, I enjoy the social part of it also. It's one thing sitting by the computer, compu and talking with people uh, online, but actually meeting and connecting it. I think it's I enjoy it very much. And it kind of grims, gr brings also more perspective, not only more connections, but also more perspective and, and understanding for what, how things are going on in other places. It's, it's easier to talk uh, with someone live. Uh, yep. Yeah. So this was the evening event after the, after the day event. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, skills. Uh, hmm. Who have them? I don't uh, have to say anything here. I guess you already know. And maybe you know this image and uh, this meme. Uh, it's probably <laughs> it's quite famous. So I would say if it has taken it, uh, then I'm probably interested. That would be my part. Yeah. So my crypto project that I'm focusing on, I've been working on for the last uh, year or so, is this uh, Quark. Uh, we started as a token on Alvi Chain uh, in 27th of December 2022. And it's been kind of going steady uh, there. Now we expanded to Ethereum chain with our token there. We are building our BuyBot. Uh, we have it here in, in Hindi. We, we support uh, multiple languages and multiple um, EVM blockchains. We are also looking for supporting other blockchains. Um, we have a developer working on this, doing a magnificent work, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, we have artists here also uh, that are involved with NFTs. Uh, who are artists who are, uh, hardly know what NFTs are, but we are helping them to get into it. And, and we are creating a marketplace with kind of a new uh, setup that I will be on the next slide where I, I will get into that uh, on the next one. Uh, yeah. And we, and we, 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 we kind of, um, yeah, we promote uh, fairness and, 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 uh, and uh, transparency through, the, through, through it all. Um, for uh, my story on the crypto project that I worked on, uh, you see on the left there is a screenshot from CoinGecko that says 12,000 coins. So uh, you can guess uh, by, by that I like uh, to diversify. That's not my portfolio, of course, that's all of the crypto ex that exists or at least uh, the, that are listed on the CoinGecko. But I would definitely tell you that uh, for me one of the exciting parts is to try different chains and join them and see what they can do. So for instance, my travel to crypto world was a lot of, I already told about uh, Steemit and Golos blockchains. They are there and uh, out of Steemit, uh, a lot of different uh, forks grow, and actually they are still exist. Not not all of them, but most of them still exist. And th there some of them are really interesting concept. This is like a concept for DAO, so you can make your own communities, for instance. Uh, some of them are Chinese. This is like uh, for drugs, like uh, growing weed, and uh, these are for adult industry. So basically, videos. And then the, there are other ones, this is from Cambodia, this is from Russia, and there are, there are others. So uh, these, these uh, blockchains, the Steemit blockchains, uh, that's one of the fastest, maybe still fastest, and one of the cheapest uh, blockchains. So I liked it because uh, you can actually blog on it and you can earn money. I actually earned, uh, I get my electric car, my first electric car, from earnings from uh, Golos. And uh, it's been a fun story and I met a lot of nice people there. Same way, through conferences and online talks and different projects together. And uh, 
yeah, this is this is exciting. And there is in crypto there are communities like this. There are many of them. So in Ethereum, that slide would be like 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 the one from the open source example, right? With a lot of logos. And then in some other chains, it will be maybe smaller. But there are a lot of interesting stuff to follow, to see, to learn, and uh, basically try it the same like with open source. And you know, it's it's usually completely free to try, right? <laughs> Yeah, so the marketplace that we're working on, um, it, we have the utility token now on our chain and Ethereum. We launched the Ethereum one like a few days ago. Um, we have the marketplace. We are kind of working on this. We, it's already live. Uh, it's an add-on contract feature, which uh, allows uh, more tokenomics than just uh, royalties. For those who know about NFTs, when you make an NFT, you can set kind of a tax that the owner or creator gets, and that's it. Now, we, with our system, you can also create your own contract that uh, will give you more tokenomics uh, on top of the royalties, uh, and, and without us having to chain, uh, change the main contract of the marketplace. So it's kind of accessible, and each project can develop their own um, uh, royalty schemes. Yeah, yeah kind of like royalty. You can kind of provide like dividends where all the holders of the NFTs get some of the future sales um, or buyback of the token, um, some, of some token, uh, burn function, all these things that uh, for those who are into investing in these kind of cryptocurrencies, they probably know about it. For those of you who don't know about it, it's kind of more uh, abstract, I guess. Uh, we have here Pixels and Fractals. Fractals is the NFT collection of a Norwegian artist called uh, Bjorn Sosta. He's a friend of mine, and uh, yeah, you can see uh, you can see here that we have the royalties for his collection. There's five ro royalties, five ten percent dividends, and then uh, eighty five percent goes to the seller. So this is for each each uh, fu uh, future trade. So we, we are kind of quite uh, mm, proud of this. It was the developer who made it, actually came up with it. I'm really grateful for that. And, and we are kind of, um, uh, we believe it's a, it could be kind of an industry standard if, if, if it gets enough attention. So, so you try to uh, improve, make it simpler for everyone to use and uh, improve the functionality while not making it uh, too more complex. Yeah, so, so while people can make their own add-on contracts, we can also provide a service that we do it for people so they don't need to know any, anything. And uh, the artists that we collaborate with, they don't need anything. We, they can just come to us and we help set them up with everything. Um, That's great. Yeah. So and the entry point is really low now. Yeah, yeah, it's really low, and we want to make like a, to become like a hub, I, I think, for, for artists to get into and learn about uh, NFTs and, and, and crypto. So, uh, yeah, we also have the Bybot. We are, we are working on like a personal, a personal notification, uh, like the Bybot is giving uh, notifications of certain buys of certain tokens in, uh, in, in their uh, dedicated groups. We also provide the... Uh, personal notification for yourself. You can set up your own tokens that you want to track and, and you get a personal notification that so you don't need to follow the chart all the time like yeah. <laughs> some people do. And uh, we are building also an IP, IP, API service, which is kind of a challenge because it's kind of a service that is kind of dominated at the moment by a few uh, main actors. Uh, so we're trying to kind of um, look at how to do that uh, all on our own. And uh, yeah, the, we are innovating and, uh, and, and trying to improve things and making it more accessible. And, and like with my ideology, uh, ideology and way of thinking of life, I try to bring safety and transparency into everything. Uh, we also have a lo launch pad that we just released and, and we will get like multi-chain uh, support for both the uh, um, marketplace and, uh, and the launch pad. Sounds super exciting. Yeah, Hope to see one more chance as you started the, next, the second one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I, I really enjoy it. I spent a lot of time on this. So it's like a, it's kind of becoming more like a work than, than a hobby now. So, yeah. Challenges, it's kind of what I got into already a bit. Like there's a lot of challenges uh, in many ways. Uh, one guy told me the other day that it's actually just 10,000 developers for, uh, for blockchain, like uh, for Web3 in the world. And I was kind of surprised. I thought it was much more. And 
I guess it depends how you count uh, who is a developer. I, if yeah. I'm, uh, if I did a pull request to Ethereum Wallet to add a token name, am I a developer or not? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you count like that, it's probably more than a million. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, if they can use these services, uh, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, there's lots of challenges. Uh, like the entity dominance is like a big thing. I think uh, it's kind of the. I, idea of crypto is to have it open and and to to kind of make things fair and then it's kind of uh, I think it's a part of the game that the entities that are have been outside of Web3 is also stepping in to, to dominate. It's kind of how it is. I think it's quite natural actually. It's it's not. It's I mean it's just part of the of the of the process I guess and uh, yeah. Which would be the top three challenges you think out of this list, or in general, top three challenges? Uh, in Norway, it's definitely the banks, I would say. Uh, and then on a more international level, it's kind of the dominance, I would say, because it's also how they are investing and, and kind of taking over the market, more or less. So yeah. like institutions, you mean, right? Yeah. I, I, to be honest, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's a final uh, threat. To, to the to the to the open source, uh, it's just something that is happening now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, like in Norway, we we don't really depend on 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 crypto so much. We have a pretty fair system as it is. So it's harder to kind of explain people and friends how how, how the benefits of having crypto is. I think that is also something that needs to be worked on. Same with as with the software, because people yeah. don't, don't even want to try something new. Yeah. And then with crypto, so people are like they're happy with what they have, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then uh, banks. There's like I've struggled with some banks also myself, uh, and uh, I think creating a system where the where the where the tax government can kind of control things easier would make it more easy to to implement so i think that that is something that someone should focus on it would probably also be cheaper for the government if they implement it the right way yeah. uh, to because they don't need that many people working in the government to do manual uh, useless work yeah. So we have some ideas of looking at that, but uh, but it's uh, it's still not uh, so accessible for us to start with that. And uh, yeah, so uh, and loyalty, I think as an investor, it's loyalty is kind of not so easy to to find. But as a developer, I think it's more easy to find loyalty and trust in people. You connect with communities, and 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 it's easier to to find that uh, kind of common ground to work from. Uh, yeah, and this is my uh, contacts. You can also find the Quark uh, link there. Uh, if you go to, yeah, my, either my Telegram has all the information there, you can go to our community. Uh, we are on Twitter, this is me, and then it's the project, and this is our website. And it's a very nice website. Uh, I actually had some struggles with uh, listing our uh, Ethereum token on uh, Dex tools because they thought I had uh, stolen the website from another project, so I had to have the developer explain to them how forking website works and, 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 uh, and the rights of, of using it uh, for different uh, projects. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks a lot for your speech. I think that was pretty uh, fun format. How do you feel, guys? Was it, was it good? Was it fun? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Um, so now uh, we have two last things, uh, not presentations anymore. Um, so these things are, we need to vote on the first one. So this is completely optional if you want to do it. So there is this format when we have uh, stickers. And basically if you want to discuss some certain topic, you can just take the stickers with a pen and just uh, describe the topic that you would like to discuss and take the sticker with you and uh, just stick it on the table that you're going to be sitting and then we're gonna, we could do it this way so then like the topic could, could be you know crypto or you know nft <laughs> on the table and then you can just go around and see which tables are the most interesting for you in the bar in the scrap uh here uh in maybe 15 minutes or so yeah. and until then you can also just uh get there and talk to people uh, you don't have to have any particular topic but that's a good uh, hint uh, to start the ideas flowing yeah I think thanks a lot for coming and uh, hope you will come again uh, next month 
and uh, also hope that you all guys will join us in the bar to, uh, for uh, mingle and networking and uh, uh, talking more in, in depth into some interesting stuff. Yeah. And thank you for hosting this. It was very nice. If there's still someone on the stream, guys, thank you for watching. And uh, next time, please also send us questions on the YouTube. We will try to answer them and try to put somebody behind the computer. And so he can read the questions for us and we will talk and answer the questions. Thank you. Artyom, could you stop the stream? Thank you. <laughs>